You're listening to Life Check Yourself with life coach, transformational leader, and dating and relationship badass, Marnie Batista. Every week, you'll get the raw truth from top experts and real people on the important life and love issues you want to know about. So if you're ready to life check yourself in your relationships, your career, and the areas of your life that matter most to you, and you're not afraid to be called out on your uh, stuff, then you're ready for what's next. Life Check Yourself with Mark Scholes. Obsessing, why it happens, and how to get a grip now. Ladies, a welcome to the studio. I heard someone say, welcome to my remote studio the other day. And I'm like, my remote studio is always remote since I live in an RV currently. And in my remote studio, I have Mark Scholes. Uh, and you guys are going to love this one because um, he's a board member, faculty, and supervisor at the National Institute for the Psychotherapies. And he's the former co-director of the Curriculum for their adult training program in psychoanalysis. That means he trains people in all of the things he's going to be talking about. Uh, he also served on the Council of the International Association for Psychoanalytic Self-Psychology. He has a private practice in practice. New York City. And right now he he's written a book on the relationship between attachment theory infant research and self-psychology and how they help facilitate a shift you guys are going to love this from an insecure attachment style to a secure attachment style. And he wrote this book. It's called Reset Your Romantic GPS. He was on a guest on Farnoosh Tarabi's podcast, So Money. We love her uh, talking about attach attachment styles in finance. You can hear that on Spotify. You know, I read I read um, something on Twitter that said the word of the year was gaslighting. <laughs> and I feel like... Um, I feel like the syndrome of the year is attachment style. You know, yeah. like I feel like this is what everyone is talking about. And I think your book has come at the exact uh, right time. I want to just thank you, first of all, for for taking your time to dive into this work. Is there a particular reason why of your vast amount of knowledge around psychotherapy and psychoanalysis that this is what you wanted to write your book about? Uh, th first of all, thank you very much for having me on your show. It's a, it's a real honor. And, you know, I've been uh, practicing psychotherapists, psychoanalysts for 25, 30 years in the city. Um, I see lots of couples, lots of relationship therapy. And, you know, I originally was interested in this topic because of my own issues you know, in relationships when I was a younger person who spent, you know, many, many years, you know, kind of in the wrong relationships or just not getting out of certain relationships I should have. And then during my practice, I would see people, you know, waste vast amounts of time in relationships that were really not good for people that could not commit. And so I became interested in attachment theory which has been something that's been around for a while, but has really kind of exploded on the social scene in the last couple of years. And so when you think about this idea that it's something that we are like factory installed with and can it change? Cause some, and I, the reason I'm asking you this question is because I feel like people come in and they've like self-diagnosed or maybe someone told them what they were and they sort of make that their identity and then they live their life from that place you know always trying to soothe that part of them so like talk to yeah. us about like how it gets created and yeah. how that can either hurt you or help you and what we can do about it yeah so let me just give you a, like a quick idea of what, uh, how a secure attachment is formed and how an insecure attachment is formed. So you're born into the world, you're an infant, you have, you're quite dysregulated, you have, you're hungry, you have gas, you, you know, you're disoriented. And when you have an attuned enough uh, parenting milieu who responds to your needs in a good enough way, you begin to have the realization that these sort of existential anxieties that an infant has, um, somebody is responding to them and somebody is soothing them. 
And after thousands of relational moments, um, the child begins to, the infant begins to internalize the sense that the feelings that I have, uh, the world um, is responding to. And so they become less and less frightened of those feelings. They anticipate that those feelings are, are acceptable and good enough, and somebody out there is responding to them. And that gets internalized, that sense of safety, that sense of security, that sense that my feelings that I'm having are uh, acceptable. And that becomes like a life jacket. That okay. becomes something that one goes through life with, with the sense that, you know, I can deal with obstacles, I can deal with stress. Because there's a sense that um, the world is a pretty safe place. So their sense of stability and security is inside of them. And that, that forms a secure attachment. For an insecure attachment, the infant's born with the same kind of needs, the same kind of dysregulation, longings, hunger, gas, and they are not responded to in attuned enough ways. They're responded to inconsistently. They could be neglected. They could be made to feel that what they're needing is unacceptable. And so the infant and child are left having to regulate their own feelings or to dissociate from those feelings because they're obviously not going to be responded to. And something else happens when there's a lot of inconsistent um, uh, responsiveness, which is there's a sense of shame mm. that those feelings that one is needing and, 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 and feeling are not good. There must be a reason. And so they try to then become, they become then preoccupied with the other. So instead of the other being preoccupied with the infant, the child now becomes more preoccupied with how do I stay connected to my parent or caretaker? I must kind of deal with these feelings on my own or get rid of these feelings. And so now what happens for an insecure attachment is the security is outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't, they've never internalized that sense of safety. So now safety exists outside. And so that person becomes much more preoccupied with the other. How do I um, meet the other's need? What can I do to accommodate the other so the other will love me? Those are mm. two very different ways of being in the world. So when you're in that sort of unsupportive environment, or like you said, it's not attuned and that feels familiar then. So then yeah. being attracted to or being in relationships that make them unhappy, even if it feels familiar, right? So can you can you talk about, about that for a little bit? Because I think that is, it's that really smart listener who's like, I, I know this. I don't understand why I keep going back to this person or they've deleted that person's, you know, someone's phone number, blocked them. Then they're talking to them again three days later. Yeah, yeah, Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah. So that is exactly correct. So one's, one's language for attack, one's language for connectedness it is trying to figure out and take care of and be loved by the other. So being loved for the self is not something that that person with that attachment style really understands. It's not home. That kind of emotional home becomes what's familiar is being able to kind of take care of the other, to be loved by the other. And of course, um, you know, often what happens is that um, that kind of person who needs to be kind of taken care of or who needs to be attended to is usually somebody who's more aloof or more selfish or more, you know, um, damaged in their own way. And of course, we can't make somebody love us in that way. And But we're drawn to it because we're just drawn to connect. And that becomes the language of connection. So one has to first be able to have the confidence to, you know, and first of all, one has to be able to have a relationship with themselves, right? So they have to take the risk that somebody is going to care for them and love them. Then they have to be able to tolerate what does not feel familiar. And often um, we, 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 we migrate to what's familiar, even if it's not what's satisfying. 
Mm, that's like mic drop moment right there, right? Because our brain is recognizing that pattern, right, as familiar. Um, and so they we equate that with what love is. And I, I want to know your your take on this because I think so many of um our listeners love or falling in love is this very like um it can be dramatic, it can be like you know, those conversations where most of your conversations are about your relationship, you know, like I've never felt like, you know, like the drama, right. Or whatever it is, or even butterflies and rainbows, like it's a panacea or it's paradise. And so when they get with someone that's maybe a more healthy attachment, it feels eh, like I don't boring. And they'll say there's no chemistry. So is that true? Is there no chemistry or is that just that, that they are not used to that? Like, t- like help us with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, very strong chemistry comes out, can often, not always, but can often come out of a longing. There's something there that you think you can get, or there's something that the other has that feels incredibly intense. You know, relationships are not, are not really supposed to they don't feel that intensity. They're not supposed to feel that intensity. And so, yes, I think that we all need a bit of chemistry, but there is a different feeling in a relationship, in a healthy relationship. I mean, you have to be able to live without the belief that there's something out there that's going to make you whole. You know, not, mm. I mean, you have to be able to live with um you know, in psychoanalysis, believe it or not, the ability to live with that nothing can make you whole is called the depressive position. It's too bad it's called the depressive position, but it means you have to live with the good and the bad. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not something everybody can do. <laughs> I was like, that seems like that's the realistic position, it's right? The realistic position, yeah, that's right. It- it's funny. I'm watching this show, um, Indian Matchmaker. Have you ever seen this or heard of the show? I, I have not seen it, but I've wanted to. Yeah, it's because it's this whole completely counter to American like right now culture. They're basically like, look, this is a person. It's all about compromise. You know, like, yeah, love will come. But like you guys just need to get along and have a family and have good values. And it's really in, it's an interesting thing because the mindset at the very beginning it when they're using this approach is going in for compromise. And I think what happens to us dating and in relationship now, especially if you've had a divorce or a a long-term relationship that didn't work, you're into it, you're dating, you're like, hell no, I'm not compromising, right? Like I want someone to be my everything. And when Mm. you're not having that healthy attachment style, that everything can be the opposite of what it is that you really need. It often is, you know, and um, it's, it's, you know, chemist. I mean, just going back to chemistry for a moment, it literally becomes a little bit like addiction. You know, it's the same right. kind of thing. You get that, you know, beep, beep, beep. You feel that pull towards the person. And then you have this moment of intensity. But then for the insecurely attached person, they now want to hold on to that feeling. They're, they're looking to keep that feeling going. And in order to do that, there's a sense of not wanting to lose the other. So then one begins to accommodate again, to try to isolate, you know, not to speak necessarily honestly, or if there are things that they feel ashamed about, they're afraid to bring them into the relationship because they don't want to lose that feeling. And of course, that 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 road is, is not the road that's going to make a successful relationship. Successful relationship is where you can be yourself and the other person can love you for that, for the good and the bad. And again, that can feel uncomfortable for somebody who is not really in touch with their own value. Their value has been what they can do for the other, not what the other can do for them. Yeah, I totally, like I default. In fact, I was just thinking about this this morning because we're living in an RV. We've done this big experiment for the last eight or nine months. Actually, it's been almost a year. And we're sort of figuring out like what our next step is. And I realized, Mark, and I've been doing this work for a long time. I was like, my first thought is still like, what what would make my husband the most happy? Right? It's like that old patterning. Yeah. Is that right? And so I'm like, wait well, a minute. You know, I mean, you could also be a thoughtful person, but- 
but yes, it's 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 that kind of it's it's that kind of thing. But it's also you may have a feeling that you don't feel comfortable expressing because it might it might push them away. Not you, but somebody. Well, someone, and that's yeah, what, yeah. That, yes, that's what's not expressed. And you know, it it's harmful to a person. You know, and for the insecurely attached, they're really not supposed to have the attention on themselves. That's not how they grew up feeling that, you know, they would feel safe if they were to do that. Mm, Okay. So you call this sort of like your romantic GPS, right? Because in that theory, it's like the direction is set. It's impacting who you're attracted to, who you're not attracted to. Um, So how do you... Well, first of all, I love that you're basically saying you can change it, which I think is empowering, right? Like just because you have it. Absolutely change it. Okay, cool. Do y'all hear that? You're like, keep telling your story. I'm anxious. You say it like, you know, my, like your city that you live in. I'm anxious attachment. You know, like, hello, my name is and I'm right. Yes. Okay. So dump that. It's a GPS, but you can change the course just like I can change my my navigation and go to another city. So what's the first step in 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 changing your attachment style? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the reasons I wrote this book is to help people just know that there is this thing called an attachment style. It's and it's not a person's fault. It it happens in the first 18 months of life. Um, mm-hmm. It's not something that they chose. And inherently, it's it's not a it's not a bad thing. It's a just a way. It's a language. Unfortunately, it's not a language that helps a person be the best they can be. And it really has nothing to do with their essence. And what I want to help people do is be able to be more of who they are and of their essence. So the first thing is to know that there's this thing, and you can Google it. You could you can ask people about it. There are ways of learning about attachment theory. Can read my book. There are a lot of books. Yeah. Um, then you know, one of the greatest things you can do and is five minutes of mindful meditation a day, you know, and people still kind of have a strange reaction to mindful meditation. Um, but it's been so proven to be such a beneficial thing. And what I mean by that is really just sitting for five minutes and focusing on your breath and allowing feelings that you're having to come. Notice things, let go of those feelings, come back to your breath. And this is a way for insecurely attached people to be with themselves and to and to notice that they can be with feelings. They don't have to get up and run away from them. They might have a sense of impulsiveness or discomfort, but that discomfort is what we want to invite. For, for insecurely attached people, the discomfort of a healthy choice is the thing we want to invite. So a little meditation, and then this is not going to be rocket science, exercise. Mm. I'll tell you why I tell people to exercise. For the insecurely attached, focusing on the self is not something that, um, you know, was encouraged. And so a lot of people have a dread around exercise. They um, they feel inertia. They feel um, exhausted when they think about doing it because it's for themselves only. And those are terrific feelings to be having, to be able to notice those feelings, and then to be to be able to exercise after that and to feel the accomplishment of, of that goal. It's all about being with discomfort. So it's and like a way of self-regulate, right? Like, is it help exact, you do that? Both exact, those things help you self-regulate? Exactly. It's a way of realizing that you have it in you to be able to be that regulator and that the other doesn't have to be the regulator, but you have it inside of you. That's the most important. And we all do, but we have to be willing to live with a certain amount of discomfort to realize that there's comfort at the other side of that discomfort. The other thing that's completely, I mean, all these things are, are don't cost anything is food and cravings. And I like to say, you know, um, be brave, ask why you crave. So when you have a craving, (laughs) you know, notice the craving, notice you're in relationship to this food at this moment. Notice that this food is calling the shots, Mm -hmm. you know, 
And as you notice that, it doesn't mean don't eat that food. It just means trying to bring a reflex into consciousness. And we have that opportunity daily with food to notice what we're feeling, to notice the relationship to food we're having, and then to be able to make a conscious choice. You might ask, would I feed this to my child? And the answer might be no. So then you think, okay, well, why am I feeding it to myself? All of these kinds of things in our daily life we can do to kind of notice our longings and cravings and and be able to make a choice that's for the self. Yeah, and this is, and I keep hearing you talk about in this, that this focus on what am I feeling? What do I need? Making choices. Even if you choose to eat the salty potato chips, like I just did, uh, I was like, oh, I'm really having like thinking about some deep stuff today and I'm feeling like some anxiety and I just worked out and I was like, I want salty chips. Right. Mm. But I had that aware. I had the awareness. It was really interesting. I was like, this is so funny. Like I know myself, but the bottom line is what you're saying is that's okay. Cause then you can make a choice and then you can make a different choice. I'm yes, real it's not about, yes, that's right. <laughs> it's really about taking something that's a reflex and then put, trying to bring it into consciousness. And it's the same thing then with the person. So somebody doesn't call you back for three days and all you want to do is to, is to, you know, call them or figure out or you're obsessing about the person that hasn't called you back and to be able to notice, boy, I'm really obsessing over someone who is not being very nice to me and not being very thoughtful. And oh boy, I don't, you know, but I, it's so hard for me to be with this feeling. What is this feeling? What is it that I'm having here? You know, is this person a good person? I mean, literally just be able to take a moment and to, to move out of the feeling into a kind of, um, you know, self-reflective state. It, it makes a tremendous amount of difference. It's huge because then you're out of that victim -y, like why, you know, you're asking, what I hear Mark you saying is you're starting to ask questions that are like empowering questions. You can actually use that information. You might um, ultimately know the answer versus why didn't he call me? Like, you'll never know unless he actually tells you. So- right. Right. So this is all really important. So I want to make sure we touch on this because we have so many things to talk about. But and this was for sure me when I first started doing this work is if we look at attachment style and you said like it happens in the first 18 months, it's not your fault. And whether you have like a great relationship with your parents now or you don't or they're deceased, People are like, oh, I don't want to think about this because I don't want to blame my parents or I already did that work or, you know, I don't want to bring that up. So let's talk about that. Like, are your parents to blame? Like, you know, should you confront your parents if they're alive? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I don't it's, um, you know, are they to blame? I mean, they were raised by parents. Look, there are some parents that are really toxic. And, right. you know, and um, and really just downright, you know, a neglectful and, and abusive. But you put those aside. I mean, you know, an attachment style has um, there's a there's generational attachment styles. So, you know, mm. we we do the best we can. But, um, yeah, I mean, if your family is one in which you think that there's room to talk to them about it. I would say, yes, I think if there is, um, you know, if you're going to get met with the, the the same problem that existed early on, which is, you know, you're too sensitive. I don't mm. know what you're talking about. You know, you got it wrong. And it just kind of reinforces, you know, a kind of uh, responsiveness that you already that already caused the issue. I would say I would say no, it's not imperative that one confronts their parents. Uh, um, and are they to blame, you know? we all had a childhood. So yes and no. I heard once uh, when I, I did the Hoffman process and, and one of the things they said is everyone is guilty and no one is to blame. And I thought that's, that was, that's lovely. Isn't that great? Right. That's correct. Yes, yeah. that's great. Um, and the other thing that I, and I, I'd love for, since you're a, a, this is your expertise. The other thing that I think is interesting is as parents then start to think about this and how are they're parenting, right? And so what would happen 
in like this meta metaphorical world where you put your baby in the middle of the room and every time it made a noise, you, you attended to it. My guess yeah. is that that is also going to cause another yeah. unhealthy attachment style. Yeah. I mean, I think I could have been guilty of that as a, as a parent. And yes, that, that is not, that is not the goal either because of course, the, the child needs to be able to stretch themselves and needs to be able to feel that they can tolerate, you know, certain amounts of attention and certain amounts of discomfort. And the good news is, you know, for parenting, it's really, it's just about good enough. It's really about good enough. It's, you know, if, if, if a child gets neglected or you don't respond to a child, you know, one time the child's crying too long, that that's not what's going to be the problem here. It's really a pattern of of misattunement. It's a pattern of non-responsiveness. But good enough responsiveness is really is really the best you can do. I love that because you know I think that you said that you know we don't want to blame or shame ourselves for our attachment style. And that is inherent in that is that there is no perfect like there is no perfect way that it could be done. I mean, if is there are there statistics about like how many people are like I have a healthy attachment style. I never had to go to therapy. I never did I mean, was what what's the data on that? Uh, it's I, I think there's probably like maybe 3%, you know. I mean, it's it's Bless for those, those people. <laughs> you know, for those people, it's really look, it, it's wonderful if, uh, to have a sense of internal um, buoyancy. And it doesn't mean that problems don't come and stresses don't come, but they're they they're approached with a sense that the world's not going to come to an end. They they're they're experienced with the sense that this is not going to make me a bad person if I fail this. I can try this. I can fail. That's that's okay. For for a more insecurely attached person, the security is in the moment. There's a kind of impulsiveness since the security isn't inside and it's outside. If you're having an anxious moment, all we want to do is to have that anxiety stop. Mm -hmm. So we'll do whatever we have to do in that moment to make it stop. It doesn't make for um, the ability to really delay instant gratification for more long-term satisfaction. And that's one thing we want to help people with an insecure attachment with because, um, you know, they can't make their best decisions for themselves when they're looking just to soothe an anxiety that um, they don't feel that they're able to do inside of themselves. Oh, that's so, I mean, like, yeah. that's it right there. I love that. Yeah. Um, so do you have, so here's my other myth I want to debunk, or you're going to say, no, it's true. Do, is this something to change your attachment style? Does this take like years and years of therapy? Is it something that you can do when once you're aware, like pretty easily if you do those things you were talking about? Yeah. You know, I think there are people who when they learn enough about it and they're able to make some, you know, what I like to call the discomfort of healthy choices, experiment with walking away from things that aren't good for you. Notice when they're not good for you experiment with, you know, meditating and exercising and making choices around food that may feel depriving. Um, but, you know, and to be able to live with those feelings and to be able to be kind to those feelings, um, you know, it's like being a captain of a ship. If you turn the wheel just a little bit, the journey is going to go to a very different place. So we don't need huge changes to change things. We just need a little bit of change to really change the course. And it will become pretty clear to a person if they take a moment um, to see who's in front of them and to see whether or not the person in front of them is really the, the, the kind of person they would want to give their vulnerable part to. Hmm, that's so and, beautiful. Um, you know, and if it's not... To live with taking care of the self and saying no to somebody like that, it can feel very um, anxiety producing. But if you can do it, it takes one or two times and you realize that um, everything is going to be okay. Um, yeah, change can happen without therapy. Change can also, therapy, look, I'm a therapist. Yeah, I'm a believer. 
Yeah. And, you know, I think it facilitates and can be a really, really um, positive force in one's life. And um, and since COVID, one, the, one of the few positive things about COVID is it's put mental health into the foreground. And it's, yeah. it's, it's up the anxiety in everybody. And so it's much more acceptable to, to, you know, to be seeking out a therapist or to be talking about one's feelings. I, so I'm, 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 uh, I, I think it's amazing. Like I can be out with like a couple, you know, and you're talking and we're talking about like what my therapist said, or, you know, this is why I was anxious or, um, my kids are like in their mid twenties and like all of, you know, they have therapists and their friends have yes. therapists and the 20 year old. Right. Right. <laughs> and I just think it's so, it's so great. Right. Because we're just saying like, uh, the mythology of the Instagram life is not real and life is challenging. Yeah. And so how do we learn yeah. how to, and what you said, I want to end with this because this is why like you are so my people, you were like, how can we live our life like more fully from our essence, from who we really are? Because those attachment patterns are just patterns. It's really yeah. not who we are. So can you kind of end in talking about like, what does that yeah. mean to you to live from essence? Yeah. You know, I mean, you you have the Institute of Living Courageously, right? I, I am so in line with with that with 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 that sentence and that the way of thinking about that. You know, people with an insecurely attached, you know, attachment style are incredibly sensitive and empathic and um really great people. And what I want for them is to be able for them to be able to make the choices that will make them happy and will make them more fulfilled. And, um, and so, you know, and, and that's so in reach, mm. it's so in reach, you know, for them and, and it's a goal that they should have. Mm, I love that. I love that. So I love you, Mark Scholes. Um, <laughs> so sweet. So you're so amazing. Um, I really appreciate you being here. I, I just want everyone to really hear like that just because you got that, it doesn't mean that that's your destiny. That doesn't mean that you are stuck with it. And it, it really want, like when I say, I want you to damn life check yourself as I do at the end of every mm -hmm. episode, it's like, if there are people in your life and it feels like you're in a pattern, it feels familiar, but it's not bringing you joy. We listen to this about 47.3 times, you know, um, and make notes and really, really practice those things that that uh, Mark Scholes is talking about. And of course, go get his book. The, the link will be in uh, the show notes. You definitely, uh, definitely want to check that out. And also you can go to his website, Mark Scholes, LCSW dot com you're gonna have like all these people in manhattan they're gonna be flooding your inbox uh thank you for being here so much it was such a pleasure thank you so much you you, you make it very easy to talk so i really appreciate that yay i love it so ladies we'll see you next time but in the meantime really seriously life check yourself talk to you soon bye bye Hey, thanks for tuning into today's show. So if being in an intimate relationship in which you feel 100% seen, heard, and accepted by a high caliber man is a priority for you right now, and you're interested in seeing if you're a fit for working with me and my team at Dating with Dignity, here's what I want you to do. Just head over to DWDVIP, that's D as in dating, W, D as in dating, VIP.com, and book a call to speak with my team. We'll get on the phone with you for about 60 minutes and you'll get crystal clear on what's stopping you from finding true love right now. We'll also take a look at what you want to create, what you want your whole life to look like when you're able to finally be fully expressed as a woman in a healthy relationship with an incredible guy. And if we can help you get from where you are right now to where you want to be, we will show you the fastest path possible that makes sense for you to do that. We help smart, successful women all over the world solve this one missing piece in their life so they can finally have it all. So to see if we can help you do the same thing, head over to DWDVIP.com. I'm Marnie Batista, and let's talk soon.